It is really, truly an honor uh, to introduce Dr. Kerry. Obviously, Dr. Kerry can't be with us here today, but I can't think of anyone more deserving of the Morton Award than, uh, than Bob. And as a, uh, a disclaimer, I nominated Dr. Kerry for the award, and it was a very easy nomination. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Kerry. I've known him my entire career. We're contemporaries and grew up together in the areas of hypertension, cardiovascular disease, Dr. Kerry, particularly in endocrinology. Uh, and kidney disease, myself as a general internist. Dr. Carey is Dean Emeritus uh, and Professor of Medicine at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. He is a leader in the hormonal control of blood pressure and hypertension. He has made major contributions to the understanding of the renin angiotensin system, which we'll discuss, the renal dopaminergic system, and mechanisms of pressure naturesis. Dr. Carey's studies encompass, excuse me, a combination of both worlds, the basic science world and the clinical world, in that he's combined cell and molecular approaches in in vivo animal and cell culture experiments in the basic science lab, and then he runs out that door and he runs to the hospital door and also patient-oriented clinical investigations. Uh, really a, uh, an, an incredible man. He is also a leader in clinical hypertension, as I've already alluded to. He's authored two Endocrine Society clinical practice guidelines that are in use today and served as vice chair of the 2017 ACCAHA Blood Pressure Guideline Writing Committee co-chair. That, that guidelines, as you know, are last guidelines from this country in hypertension, and it's re redefined the definition of hypertension. It's introduced cardiovascular risk into the decision-making process, which we will discuss later this afternoon, and also, it's lowered the thresholds for not only starting antihypertensive medications and also when are we going to stop antihypertensive medications. In other words, what's our therapeutic threshold and what's our therapeutic target? He's also uh, been uh, uh, tremendously involved in many other writing committees. He's also been in another uh, AHA, Scientific Writing Committee, most recently to define the guidelines for resistant hypertension. Dr. Carey was Dean of the University of Virginia School of Medicine from 1986 to 2002. Think about that for a minute. The average Dean life is three and a half years. I know that very well because I was Dean at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine. But let me say that again. Dr. Carey was Dean of the University of Virginia School of Medicine from 1986 to 2002. That says it all. He served as president of the Endocrine Society and past chair of the AHA Hypertension Council. And in 2022, or excuse me, 2020, he was named a distinguished scientist of the American Heart Association, the most prestigious uh, rec uh, honor that the AHA can, dis can bestow on a researcher and a clinician. Dr. Kerry planned to be president uh, and to present the role of the renin angiotensin system today. We've contacted him, and initially when we told him he won the award, we asked him for the title of his lecture, and this is what he gave us. Unfortunately, he can't be with us today, but it's my honor and pleasure. I will try to do my best. Obviously, it will not be uh, as, as detailed, et cetera, as Dr. Carey would give, because he's the expert uh, on the system. But let me go ahead and give you an overview of the renin angiotensin system in a very, very brief uh, presentation, not only to, to, to uh, sort of like summarize the importance of Dr. Carey's career and what he's contributed to both basic science and clinical medicine, but also to really highlight the system, to highlight the renin angiotensin system, because in all of us in this room, this system came clinically available in our lifetime. This didn't come available 200 years ago or 100 years ago. What we're going to talk about in terms of the therapeutic approach to inhibiting the renin angiotensin system is in our practicing lifetime. And think about, while I'm presenting, think about what we did without it, without the knowledge of the renin angiotensin system, and more importantly, without the therapeutic tools, the modalities of inhibiting the renin angiotensin system now at various uh, points within its cascade. With that, let's go ahead and start. Do I turn this on, Randy? Yeah, just click it. Oh, boy. Oh, disclaimer. My residents and students will tell you never put a remote control in my hand <laughs> because I absolutely will screw it up. And I, and I have done it repeatedly. Thank you very much, Rob. Now, all I have to do is hit this little arrow, right? That's the theory. 
Uh, don't, don't hold your breath. <laughs> Learning objectives. We had a planning committee meeting yesterday to plan the next year. And it's increasingly important, to, again, proactive, as Dr. Patel just told us. Well, what is, what's proactivity in education? It's having an objective, learning the why, and then hopefully fulfilling that objective and that why. So what are the objectives for this morning? Number one, to review the renin angiotensin system cascade and its role in sodium and blood pressure homeostasis. A no-brainer, but let's go ahead and review it so we're all on the same page. But more importantly, to determine the pathophysiologic role of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system in cardiovascular disease, particularly hypertension, heart failure, kidney disease, including diabetes and adrenal disease. We'll only touch on these. But actually, more importantly, and I, what I wanted to really address this morning is the multiple different approaches to inhibiting this system, all of which have just dramatically and revolutionary changed our approach to, to medical conditions. Okay. A simplified cascade of the renin angiotensin system. You should appreciate me being up here because if Dr. Carey brought it, his slide of the renin angiotensin system, it would be all over the place because it's so ubiquitously important in human physiology, but also human pathophysiology. But very simplistically, this is the original uh, renin angiotensin system. It's far more elaborate than this, as you know. And you know there's a circulating renin angiotensin system, which is what we're really blocking with, with ACE inhibitors, et cetera. But there's also a tissue-specific renin angiotensin system that's independent of the circulating renin angiotensin system. And we're trying to decipher the roles of each of those uh, systems. But nevertheless, when we block the system, we block both of them, as long as the agent can get into the cell. So it starts in the liver, in angiotensinogen. If you look at the normal pathway uh, in orange, angiotensinogen is a large molecule produced in excess. It's inactive on its own. And as you know, renin. Uh, it comes in contact with renin. Renin converts it to angiotensin 1, which is also inactive, but a much smaller peptide, 10 amino acid peptide from 100 amino acid peptides. And all the action now happens in the lung, except in the tissue uh, system, if you will. And that's the angiotensin converting enzyme. ACE in the lung converts it to angiotensin 2, and that's where all the action is because angiotensin II is the active uh, agent of the renin angiotensin system. It fixes to its specific receptors, and there are many angiotensin II acceptors, but the important one is the AT1 angiotensin I receptor in terms of blood pressure regulation, cardiovascular regulation, if you will. But it also goes to the adrenal gland and produces aldosterone, and that's why it's the RAS system, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, because it's all put in place. Under normal conditions right now, it's active. It's probably a little less active because we're sitting, but as soon as we walk up to go to the break, it's going to turn on within seconds to get us into the upright position with other systems. And it regulates not only blood pressure control by vasoconstriction so that we can stand up, but it also regulates sodium and water balance so that we can continue to stand up throughout the day. However, under certain conditions, as we've already mentioned, it's patho it also plays a role in pathophysiology of human disease, and we've already mentioned many of those diseases. So blocking the system also has advantages when appropriate, in the appropriate person, in the appropriate clinical condition. And in my lifetime, every single one of these steps now can be blocked. Before, we just only had one mechanism or two mechanisms, and now every system, every step, we, can, we have agents that can block it. And the question is where, when, how, and why, et cetera. And is there any difference between these agents? So what are some of the clinical indications that we all now well know uh, in this room? This is nothing I'm bringing that's new, that renin angiotensin inhibition is critical. I don't even say good or helpful, critical. Well, hypertension, as you're going to see. It's the foundation of our hypertension protocols now for the pharmacologic treatment of the patient with hypertension. All types of hypertension, the whole cascade, from essential, primary hypertension, to resistant, accelerated, malignant hypertension. And even if the hypertension is not primary, if it's secondary through renal artery stenosis, renin angiotensin inhibitors have completely 
done away with interventions in the kidney, other, other than some rare instances. Why? Because medical treatment is absolutely the same as intervention and surgical treatment in renal artery stenosis, and that's in my lifetime. Congestive heart failure. It's the foundation of congestive heart failure, low ejection, fraction, systolic dysfunction, as you all know, and, and post-myocardial infarction. And the kidneys in proteinuria, not only reducing proteinuria as a phenotype, as a biomarker, but also, more importantly, the outcome, which is present, preventing renal dysfunction long-term with chronic use. It's amazing how, and, and there's many, many more, more esoteric er, uh, roles for renin angiotensin inhibition, but this is 98% of the reasons why we use these in our practices. So with that, let's talk about the approaches that we, that we have available to us, where we've been, so we can see where we've come from, and then where we are now, and maybe discern some uh, differences in terms of our approach in terms of using this medication or that medication, or just one medication for that matter. In my lifetime, we've all lived this. Renin angiotensin inhibition is 30, 40, 50 years old, that's all. But it has to start somewhere. It started with an agent, I don't know how many of you know this, this uh, uh, agent, Saralacin. It's a angiotensin one receptor antagonist. Remember, ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers, came 40 years later. The very first renin angiotensin inhibitor was an AT1 angiotensin receptor blocker, serolacin. Well, what was its limitations? Number one, it was only intravenous. And number two, it was a partial agonist. It wasn't completely a blocker. It was, it was a complicated compound. And it also could agonize the receptor, which means it could turn on the receptor and elevate the blood pressure in addition to inhibiting it. But it was used. It wasn't used clinically for treatment, but it was used to diagnose renal artery stenosis. You would give an injection if the blood pressure went way down. You would suspect renal artery stenosis because it was blocking the activity of angiotensin 1 as a, as just a, as a marker, if you will. But it didn't last long because it was an agonist. There were other mechanisms then and other modalities to make the diagnosis of renal artery stenosis. But it's interesting to think that the very first one was an AT1 receptor antagonist, serolacin. All the action really started here with tepratide. Tepratide is a peptide-like uh, compound, and believe it or not, it's found in viper venom. And hematologists were looking at viper venom to block kinase 2 for other reasons, for hematologic reasons. Well, there are two doctors from Squibb. Uh, Drs. Cushman and Andetti thought about this, got a hold of Russell Vapor, uh, Venom, Viper Venom uh, from Asia and the, the Far East, and started uh, uh, synthesizing and um, modifying tepratide, and then making it, purifying it, and making it available. What did tepratide turn out to be? Not only did it block kinase 2, but kinase 2 also is ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. So it was the first angiotensin-converting enzyme uh, inhibitor, ACE inhibitor. But again, it was only intravenously available. But as the first ACE inhibitor, I trained at, the, at an institution, and it made my career, uh, Boston University, after I trained at Penn State, which had the premier group uh, looking at blood pressure regulation, hypertension, and the renin angiotensin system at the time. And we got tepratide first and gave it to people. Gave it to people with malignant hypertension, and the blood pressure dramatically came down. But still, it was intravenous, and it was short-acting, but it was the first ACE inhibitor. Well, doctors Cushman and Andetti worked for Squibb, and they looked at tepratide. They developed the, the model of its, of its biochemical structure, and then went to work on developing an oral ACE inhibitor. And they did. The first oral ACE inhibitor was, as you know, was Captopril made by Squibb, revolutionized everything. But there was issues with Captopril. They put a sulfhydryl group on purpose on Captopril, and it turns out the sulfhydryl group probably contributed to some of the side effects of Captopril, such as the taste, dyskusia, there was rash, and there was even agranulocytosis uh, with uh, Captopril. But these were rare, but nevertheless, they happened. And we tracked it back down to it was probably the sulfhydryl group, but it was short-acting but was still used, and again, it was approved by the FDA for heart failure, 
and for hypertension. Again, revolutionized the, the renin angiotensin world, if you will. Merck watched from a little bit of a distance, but not very far, and said, well, if the sulfhydryl group may be a problem, let's make one without a sulfhydryl group. And that's enalapril. And sure enough, Merck made enalapril, uh, the first non-sulfhydryl ACE inhibitor, uh, as you know, and then enalapril was approved by the FDA for those diseases that I mentioned and became a mainstay. And actually, since it was longer acting, uh, it could be given once a day uh, if you gave it in high enough doses, but it still was relatively short acting and Merck knew that too. So Merck had a parallel track and also made uh, an al uh, lisinopril, as you can see, and lisinopril was the first ACE inhibitor that was once a, truly once a day, again, approved by the, the FDA, and the, no, lisinopril now has stood the test of time. It's the number one leading ACE inhibitor. It's available, safe, effective, affordable globally, and it's generally the global ACE inhibitor uh, when you look at global markets, global countries, making decision-making on what procurements, et cetera, because it's generic. I skipped over enalaprolat. Let's go back to, an, to tepertide. Remember, tepertide was given for malignant hypertension, and it was intravenous. Well, we thought, well, perhaps we, there's a role for an intravenous ACE inhibitor clinically, not only in maybe a, a emergent treatment of hypertension, but also when you're, you're in the hospital with an ACE inhibitor and you're NPO and you need IV, ACE inhibition. Enalaprolat was developed. I did the studies, most of the studies on enalaprolat uh, that led to its FDA approval. It's called IV Vasotec generically because it's the metabolite of enalapril. And it's available still today and we use it ubiquitously in the hospital system. Again, we're appropriate. Those are the, our ACE inhibitors. Let's go back to serolacin and the angiotensin 1 receptor. It took another 40 years for angiotensin 1 receptor blockers to become available, obviously through clinical testing, et cetera. ARBs, as opposed to ACE inhibitors, do not cause cough or angioedema, a huge uh, advantage of angiotensin receptor blockers over ACE inhibitors. The first one was Lovsartan. It's very short, it's shorter acting, still a mainstay because it's available, affordable, obviously safe uh, and effective. Valsartan was the second long-acting ARB, and now there are multiple other ones that are truly once a day pharmacokinetically and pharmacodynamically. So within a short period of time, we have a whole family of ARBs, and that has really increased our ability uh, in terms of treating patients safely, et cetera, and bypassing the cough and the angioedema, which, as you know, there's disparities uh, of angioedema uh, and cough particularly in our, heightened in our black population, our Asian population, and somewhat in our Latin American population. It's not a, a, just an incidental finding. It's, uh, it can, can be serious. Then, renin was targeted. Remember the cascade, the different cascades that we, that we showed you? There's obviously renin inhibitors available. Alaskrin was the first and still the only one. And the only reason it was the first and only one, there's no advantage of using it over ACE inhibitors or predominantly now ARBs, and thus it's fallen out of clinical disfavor. But that completes that cycle of every single point in the renin angiotensin system now we can inhibit. Why is, it, why is the renin angiotensin system so critical, and why is Dr. Carey's work so important? It's the foundation now of the treatment of, of hypertension and the treatment of congestive heart failure and renal uh, insufficiency, CKD, and proteinuria. This is just hypertension because it's my area. I know it best. There's three classes of, of antihypertensives that are recommended now in our clinical practice. The foundation, as you're going to see, is RAS inhibitors, whether it's ACE inhibitors or I'll make a passionate plea for ARBs. But nevertheless, the system is now at the, at the forefront. In addition to thiazide, or thiazide-like diuretics, and calcium channel blockers, predominantly amlodipine, a 1,4-dihydropyridine. But the most important point is to place the renin angiotensin system in where it belongs, which is at the top. I always use this because I always get asked about beta blockers, even though that, this, that isn't this talk. Beta blockers are obviously important. They're important for targeted uh, uh, comorbidities, but not to lower the blood pressure uh, per se unless as a fifth or sixth drug, and that would be a very unusual case. 
But for comorbidities, of course, beta blockers are useful, but you'll not find them uh, on the recommendations for the treatment of blood pressure, uh, if you will. This is a, well, I don't know what that is, but okay. <laughs> the last time that happened to me, I was giving a talk in Scottsdale, no, Palm Springs, uh, California, and that little beeper went off and it was the largest er earthquake California ever experienced. <laughs> and boy, did we run out of that hotel. <laughs> that actually did happen, it's a true story. Again, why is the renin stent system so important uh, in, our, in our cardiovascular disease portfolio? And this is an example too. I'm gonna make a passionate plea that, in, in, and this is, Dr. Patel, close your ear, ears. Uh, instead of starting one antihypertensive medication initially upon the diagnosis of hypertension, start two. And start them at the same time at half maximal doses. We will get past that therapeutic inertia very, very quickly and increase our blood pressure control rates. And that's the foundation of the World Health Organization and CDC's Global Hypertension Initiative, which I'm on the leadership team and travel around the world, uh, hoping to increase our control rates for hypertension and now into this country as well. There's a reason. Initial combination therapy for hypertension has tremendous advantages shown on this slide. Some of them are more important than others. Eventually, you're gonna need two to three medications to treat hypertension now that we have lower and lower uh, thresholds to start therapy and lower and lower targets to achieve. So you're going to need two medications 85 to 95 percent of the time anyway. So start with the end in mind and start with two medications at half maximal doses. When you start two complementary classes of medications, you'll also have greater blood pressure reduction quicker and perhaps even synergistically. The lower doses achieve markedly less side effects of each of the agent just because of dose, but also because the perfect... Uh, complementary co uh, combinations, if you will, also decrease the side effects of each other. And think about that, it's well, it's well known. It's simplified, better adherence, especially if it's in one pill versus two pills. We'll talk about that a little bit later. It reduces clinical inertia, which is our fault. That's on us, not titrating, et cetera, adding when clinically appropriate. But this is, I think, more important, especially when we talk about disparities and, and equities uh, of care. There are some racial and ethnic differences in the blood pressure response to our hypertension medications when used singly. But when you use them together, that, is all, that all goes away when there's complementary classes. So when you use two medications at once, it doesn't matter who walks in your door or what their background, et cetera. And that's why this is such an important message globally when we talk about one uh, approach to hypertension for the entire world, which is what we're doing. And that the crux of that is using two complementary medications together at the same time, because then that eliminates the disparities of blood pressure reduction between groups. And also there's long-term economic benefits. So with that in mind, which two classes of those three, remember thiazides, RAS inhibitors, or CCBs should we choose from? I was asked to convene a group of experts around the world several years ago. Uh, and right smack in the middle of the pandemic, we did this. We came up with a consensus statement published in the Journal of Clinical Hypertension, as you can see. And we came out with a, a white paper, which has largely been accepted now globally, that yes, start two, but then which two? We would recommend starting a RAS inhibitor, again, placing the RAS inhibitor right smack at the top, and a calcium channel blocker as a combination. Within the RAS inhibitors, I've already given away the secret, we prefer an, a, an ARB versus an ACE because of the lack of cough and angioedema, especially if you're gonna go worldwide uh, with a simplified and standard protocol, which we've done. So ARBs over, over ACE, ACE, as you can see, but still it's RAS inhibition first and CCB. If there's reasons you can't use RAS inhibition or don't have it, it's not available, you have a woman that's childbearing potential, or pregnant, of course, you can't use a RAS inhibitor. You can use CCB, I'm sorry, yeah, CCB and, and a thiazide diuretic, as you can see. Before that, it's thiazide. You pick the thiazide instead of the RAS inhibitor, always combine it with a, uh, with a RAS inhibitor first if you can.
And now lastly, the mineralocorticoids. Remember aldosterone the, was the last uh, stop in the cascade. And of course, now we know that blocking the mineralocorticoid receptor just doesn't spare potassium, which we used to call them potassium sparers. Well, yeah, they, put, they spare potassium by blocking aldosterone at the level of the kidney and, and, uh, and again, stopping potassium excretion. But now they're pathophysiologic uh, uh, agents as well that improve a clinical disease, if you will. Mineralocoid receptor antagonists have been along, around for a long, long time. It started with spironolactone. It's still available. It's our mainstay because it's cheap, effective, and long-acting. But it has androgen effects. It's also the most potent of our MRAs because you can use it in high doses. Apilronone then came along, and the advantage of apilronone was it has no androgenic effects, which is a, a very, very helpful, obviously, uh, in, in our monetarium, but it was a little bit more expensive and less available. But nevertheless, it was a step in the right direction. And now we have phenylrenone, which has, again, no androgenic effects, and it's just been reported and approved where it has some safety profile and some positive renal and cardiovascular outcome endpoints as well. Now for the future, we're not done. Aldosterone is, just like ACE, is the key enzyme that converts um, angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 and starts the active cascade of the renin angiotensin system. Aldosterone synthetase is the key enzyme that produces aldosterone in the adrenal gland. We've not been able to inhibit uh, aldosterone synthesis, but more correctly, we have been able to inhibit it, but it also plays a smaller role in cortisol. Um, uh, met metabolism and conversion, so we didn't have aldosynthase inhibitors until just this year. So 2023, the first report came out of an oral aldosterone synthetase inhibitor uh, for treatment of hypertension that does not perturbate cortisol, and the first study's already been published. I'm sure it's going to, there's going to be others, but it lowers blood pressure in the first clinical trials. Uh, again, as spironolactone or apilronone, uh, et cetera, would have done. So now there may be another target, advantages, disadvantages, I don't know. Uh, we'll have just to wait further, further uh, research and the clinical trials and potentially FDA approval and see where it goes. But that's a snapshot of the future. Aldosterone is incredibly important. Again, I mentioned it was originally just for potassium sparing to block it. Well, now we know clinically it plays a major role in resistant hypertension. 30 to 40 percent of our patients with resistant hypertension, which is defined as an individual with hypertension, that's still above your, uh, your goal, despite three antihypertensive agents of those classes at maximal doses, and they're taking them, a la Dr. Patel. <laughs> we never imagined that it was playing this degree of a role uh, in blood pressure regulation, and now, however, blocking aldosterone in resistant, resistant hypertension patients has become a key. And as you're going to see, by the pathway to study. The question always was, if you're on three medications and, not, not, and you're not controlled, what's the best fourth medication? Now, again, we're getting to rare and rare individuals, but this is still 10 to 15% of our population. Well, the pathway to study looked at placebo, just keeping them on placebo. This is a short-term trial, so you're ethically able to do that. But also then, what other agent? Spironolactone was compared to doxazosin, an alpha-1 receptor blocker, to a beta blocker by Soprolol, one of the more common beta blockers worldwide. And there's no question spironolactone wins hands down. It's double the blood pressure reduction of any of the other agents, and that's why it's our mainstay for our fourth antihypertensive agent, whatever, whatever mineralocorticoid receptor uh, antagonist you choose of course, spironolactone still being the most uh, widely uh, available. But impressive data, and shown another way, this is the blood pressure reduction going up. You can see it's eight-ish, almost nine millimeters of mercury further reduction in patients with resistant hypertension versus any of the other three groups compared to placebo. And this was placebo-controlled, which is pretty, pretty admirable. But again, that is why now it's recommended as our fourth antihypertensive agent. Fifth, sixth, success, seventh, you can get to the clonidines, the beta blockers, et cetera. But hopefully, with appropriate use of mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists at increasing doses, now you're up to about 95 to 98 percent of individuals that will, that will be controlled. So let's summarize and conclude, again, in Dr. Carey's honor. 
the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is critical to not only homeostasis, allowing me to stand up here and, and talk to you, but also salt and water regulation long term. However, what could be good can also be bad. Heightened activity of the RAS system plays a critical pathophysiologic role in a number of cardiovascular diseases, as we all know in this room, diabetes and kidney disease. I was sitting in the back listening to Dr. Patel. By the way, in medical school, they'll also tell you, if there was a seat in the hallway, I would have been in that seat uh, in the amphitheater. I've been a notorious backroom uh, person throughout my, my career and even as a student. But it struck me, how many times did he mention ACE and ARB in, his, in the polypharmacy? And again, that's, it's important in terms of understanding polypharmacy and D. You know, D prescribing, if you will, as he, as he mentioned. But that struck me. That was, that was for a reason. That's how important they are. The pharmacologic inhibition or blockade of key steps in the renin angiotensin system is now readily available and affordable. The challenge, however, is we're not doing it. So that's why I wanted to get up here for this one bullet. In 2023, our hypertension control rates are dismal. Our cardiovascular congestive heart failure, morbidity, mortality hasn't changed very much. Why? Therapeutic or clinical inertia, we're not prescribing it. Education to our patients, again, patient adherence is an issue. Cost is less of an issue other than some of the newer congestive heart failure agents because all, all the original RAS inhibition uh, pathways are all generic and they're safe and uh, readily available and affordable. So I challenge all of us, despite polypharmacy, et cetera, but in the proactive world and being in, with precision medicine world, there's a tremendous need for renin angiotensin blockade in addition to other agents as well. It's played a critical role uh, in our management of cardiovascular disease, again, in our lifetimes. Think about what you would do. What would we do without RAS inhibition for the treatment of hypertension? Take that. Just for a minute, just think about it. Take that block away, and you've got thiazides, you've got calcium channel blockers, and you've got beta blockers. Well, that was our life before RAS inhibition, and that was not a fun life, because I was part of that. I transitioned through this during my career. So please, um, again, honor Dr. Carey. Uh, he's done an incredible, incredible job. Wonderful. I wish he was here, because he's a better person than he is a researcher and scientist. And thank you for having me in his stead. Dr. DePetty, that was excellent. You know, he gave us some more talk, and actually he's going to be speaking this afternoon about some, uh, I guess, landmark studies that happened during COVID, so we'll get to hear him once again. Dr. DePetty uh, did a presentation some of this last year, and it sort of changed my practice a little bit. Um, I always like to stay away from thyroid diuretics in, in the older population. Uh, I have students that come through all the time, and I, I used to ask them, well, what's your number one preferred antihypertension? They'd say, well, hydrochlorothiazide. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, it's cheap, you know, it gets rid of fluid and all this. Well, with my older patient population, oh my gosh, uh, you know, they're not drinking enough water, they're constipated, and also hydrochlorothiazide raises sugar. So then we start worrying about diabetes and things like this. And have you ever heard of gout? My patients can't feel blood pressure, but they definitely feel when their uric acid level goes up, they have a gout attack. But uh, enough of that. If there's any further questions, please, uh, for Dr. Petty, any questions? I, I, I have one here. I'm, I'm like most of the people, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. One of the problems we've seen with the Sinopro, you know, the older patient comes in, they get a little dehydrated, yep. and then, you know, they do a total joint, and then about the second day post-op, uh, they start going to acute renal failure. Yep. It's a transit that comes back. Sure. Are the arms, do they have less effect like that versus the ACE inhibitors? No, they are equally potent in blocking the renin angiotensin system. So whatever happens with an ACE could ha will happen with an ARB and vice versa, other than the side effect profile. The ARBs clearly do not increase cough or angioedema because they don't in interfere with bradykinin as the ACE inhibitors do. Very, very important. Thank you, for, thank you, thank you for that, that uh, uh, introduction, if you will, to another set, which is hospital-based, is completely different 
than outpatient basis. Dr. Patel said, we want to probably take medications away while they're in the hospital because they're seriously ill, like surgery, fluid balances, et cetera. So we, we hold our read and angiotensin inhibitors the day before uh, surgery of any, of any kind, even orthopedic surgery, and then only add it on later during the, the post-operative recovery. Thank you. Yep. Other question? Just in general, I've heard arguments about how to obtain a blood pressure. Typically, what happens is a patient walks in, the nurse yep. sits them down, puts the cuff on, takes their blood pressure, and that's what's reported. And there were physicians for years that I, I trained with that said the way you check hypertension is you put the patient at rest with a blood pressure cuff on their arm in, in, in a supine position for 10 minutes, then you check their blood pressure. That's their resting blood pressure. And I'm just wondering what your opinions are as to how that is. Well, believe it or not, this year that's been revisited uh, and still holds to be true. There is some evidence now that supine blood pressure may be the better predictor of long-term cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. It's just difficult to do. You can do it on an N01, in you know, an individual patient, but in a, in a busy primary care clinic, et cetera, or even specialty clinics, that's not going to be uh, 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 an appropriate method or uh, Frequent method, if you will. However, what should we be doing? We are taking blood, we are, all of us, go back, all of our blood pressures are wrong. And we do know a better way to take them, but again, it's going to be a little bit more resource intensive. And we don't have to do this on everybody, but we should be doing it on our individuals with hypertension while we're making the diagnosis and then while we're following them. And that is, that supine blood pressure has some of the same parameters of what we're going to say now. The best way or the most appropriate way to take blood pressure now is with a validated device, number one. Many of the devices we're using are not validated. Only 20% of our blood pressure med our devices are validated. So when you go back, check to see if your device is validated or not. The AMA has a website that's pretty easy to use uh, that you can check. And just plug in your model number, your name, and you'll see. Uh, so we should be using validated devices. Most of the large health systems are doing that right now, but still, even in my health system, we find some that are not validated. But better yet, same principles as the supine blood pressure. When that patient comes in, put them in a quiet room that's dimly lit if you can. Then, use an automated blood pressure device. Put it around their arm, have them sit with appropriate posture, with their feet on the floor flat, not crossed, etc. The nurse programs the automated device, or the tech, the medical tech, and walks out unobserved. And now the blood pressure machine is taking three blood pressure measurements over five minutes with no, but nobody in the room except that, that patient, take their cell phones away, et cetera, and the, uh, and the blood pressure machine. So unobserved, unattended, quiet room after about five-ish minutes of rest, and then take, five, take three measurements uh, five minutes apart, throw away the first one. It's always going to be, you're going to see this right away. First thing you're going to see is the first one is always higher. Well, if you only take one, that's it. But the second two, I average them, and that's your, that's your blood pressure. So that's the best way uh, to take them now. Now, we don't take them in my institution on everybody that way, but we do try as best we can to take the blood pressures in that, that modality in our patients with hypertension, and more importantly, while we're trying to make the, the diagnosis of hypertension, because that eliminates, um, uh, let me see, that old, that eliminates the blood pressures that are elevated, the white coat hypertension system pretty much. But again, a lot of those principles of the supine have that, in addition to the supine position. Does that help? <laughs>